What is up, everybody? Josh Tapp here again. Welcome back to the Lucky Titan podcast. And today we're here with Laura Wright. We just had a great conversation before this. We were just talking about all the different things she's been doing, how we connected. That's why I love the pre-interview. And like I've mentioned many times on this show, I just wish I could just record the whole thing, but some people would get mad at me. <laughs> you should do it. You should do we it. Should, we should just do it. You, <laughs> let's do it, Laura. Um, so we, we just had a whole bunch of really good uh, conversation. I'm excited to carry it over here into this interview today. So Laura is the founder of Sold Inc. So this is such an awesome company. I was excited to bring her on because this lady really helps people amplify sales, do it quickly. And she loves working with women, which is also fun for me because I bring a lot of people on who work with women. So I just got to start connecting all of you and make it happen. But anyways, good to, good to have you here, Laura. First off, say what's up to everybody and we'll hop in. Hello, hello, hello. I'm very excited to be here and let's dive in. Let's do it. Well, and, and Laura, I am excited to get to know a little bit about your methodology, right? I have to, let me find it really quick, but you said, but you sent it. I always ask my, my guests, this is like, if this were a mastermind, what would you name it? And I loved, I loved your line. It said, fill any program, sell any offer and create income on demand. Yeah. Support that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm said, on go. trial now. You are on trial. Go. <laughs> so this is my favorite thing and why I love the land of soul and sales is when you have the ability to understand who you are, what you do and how to monetize it. When you have the skill of sales, you can do exactly what I just said, fill any program, sell out any offer, you can create income on demand. It's the thing that I love the most about being an entrepreneur. I remember a couple of years back, uh, we were buying a house, my husband and I, and he at the time was working at a job. He's a chef or we retired him. So he's a former chef. He's, we always say he's a chef or one persnickety family right now. It's us. But um, at the time he had, you know, a chef job and even as an executive chef, they do not make a lot of money. And we were going to buy this house and they saw him as the golden star. You have a job and this is how much money we can give you to buy the house. And here I was owning, operating a multi six figure business. And I was actually seen as the liability on the loan because they didn't like trust and believe in my abilities to always earn. And I would always get in this frustrated moment of like, if you told me I need to go make $20,000 today, give me a couple hours and I can get it done. Right. That's what the skill of sales allows you to do. And the freedom of entrepreneurship is if you can craft an offer around your magnificence and know how to connect with another human. And if your solve matches their need, there you go. That's a sale. Yeah. See, I love that. Well, it's funny because you're, you're speaking to an entrepreneurial crowd and they're all saying, yep, I've tried getting a home loan too. <laughs> we, my wife and I went a couple of years ago to try and get a loan for a home. And, um, we were doing almost a million dollars in sales and they wouldn't give us a loan. I was like, I can tell you the me. secret. I can tell you the secret because we've <laughs> bought three houses now since then. <laughs> You just need 20% down and to do oh, stated yeah. income and then you get the money and they're very yeah. happy to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's what we found too. Is we just said, let's just buy it in cash. So we just stayed mm -hmm. up running because <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, it's uh, I don't like supporting banks, but anyways, good stuff. I love that. And so, you know, it's funny because in the conversation before you know, we were having before this interview, we were talking about the different ways that people like the personas people try to take on mm. when they try to sell. And, you know, I mentioned like for a lot of women I've worked with in the sales realm, when they're doing sales, they'll try to take on like a masculine energy when it's not who they are, or they'll try to be more of a flirt when it's not who they are. And guys will take on more of like a douchey side, or they'll take on more of a, <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> hyper aggressive. <laughs> when the truth is like, just be yourself. Right. <laughs> so it's I, true. I'm curious that how you're, how you're working with people on that. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. The way that sales works is number one, you do need to understand processes and framework. Uh, my coming up, I remember my very first sales experience. It was just terrible. I mean, it was wonderful and terrible. I'll say that all together. I learned the, we call it PMS, pale, male and stale and with love. Uh, but that <laughs> means like the old broken way. Uh, and it's the coercion, the douchiness, all of that bro stuff that makes your skin crawl. It's the pound the pavement, hound the person, get the yes, no matter what. And guess what? That doesn't 
work. I can't stand the concept of it's all about the numbers. It's not about the numbers. It's actually about connection. So when I started learning all those techniques, I, I couldn't do them. Like I learned them and they felt horrible. And I remember I always tell a story. I've told it no, twice today, actually. I used to sit next to this really lovely woman and she was very sweet. And she would come into the office early. P.S. I'm a really terrible employee, which is why corporate lasted like four <laughs> years for me. She would come in and we would get our list of leads to go sell for. And she would just pound the pavement virtually and on the phone. Like she would just call, 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 call. There was never a no. Her philosophy was it was never a no. It's just not right now. And she would just go and go and go. And she would stay late and do all the things. And then I would come in late. I would usually get a bagel or a coffee. I would talk with somebody. I would make one phone call, make a sale, go to lunch. Maybe I'd do something in the afternoon. I'd usually leave early. And she and I had the same close rates and it used to drive her batty. And I'll tell you what I did differently than what she did. So everyone else can do that. Number one, I was myself and genuine on every single call. So when I got into the conversation, it was genuinely about connection. Now I was selling events and trade shows, things that were like, you know, $4 million events to like a $75,000 booth in an exhibition, all different things, but they weren't like, it, was, it wasn't a magical sale, like transformation exactly the way that I do now. But I would get on a call with a human, even if they were representative of another company, and I would ask out their family. I would talk with them about real topics. I would walk them through the sales process and they would say yes, because they want to buy from someone they know, like, and trust. Right. And so when you can do that, it changes everything. The other thing that I was doing differently, and this is just a little hint to anyone who's in a traditional sales setting, is usually what happens when you get like a list of leads or you get calls that come in, everyone always goes and hammers from the top down. And what I would do is I would take my list of leads and I would just sit there and I would kind of energetically scan the list and see where my eye would catch. And when I would see somebody's name, that would be the person I would reach out to. That person, 99% of the time was the buyer. What everyone else does is they just go waste all their energy trying to do the numbers and talk with everybody. My philosophy is if you want four sales, I want you to talk to four people, maybe five, if you just want to like have a little extra just in case. You don't need to go speak to 30,000 people in order to get a handful of sales. Yeah. See, and that's such a unique perspective, Laura. Like the reason I, it, it intrigues me is because we've even found with the way that we do sales, you know, of, of leveraging podcasts to generate relationships and build value for people. We, we've found that, you know, less can be more, but it also is good to get the rep. So I'm kind of curious how you're mm. bridging that gap because yep. a lot of people, I mean, mm -hmm. you're never going to learn how to sell until you try it. Correct. Right. Oh, so my favorite thing is the, what I, my favorite thing is sales, just FYI. But why <laughs> I love sales is because as you, you learn to do it, you actually make money while you're doing it. Right. So it's okay. I, I think one of the big things is I'll, I'll talk about like sales teams and numbers and volume and everything. But what I want everyone to understand is that when you're on that sales conversation, you're making a connection, you need to have detachment from the outcome. And I think this is one of the biggest like letdowns that happens with sales is people, when you have too few leads, they become so precious that if this person doesn't buy and I can't pay my mortgage and I'm freaking out, that's the energy that's conveyed on the sales call. There is no script that can beat that if your energy is scramble or worry. So you really need to understand there's billions of people on this planet. I do not care what your niche is. I don't care what your business is. There are probably more people in this world than you could serve in a lifetime. Even if you had access to them, relax. That one person in front of you, give them time, energy, and space, but they're not the only person that has to buy. The other thing I think is this, and this is the part that has always been very like hard for me when I come in and I help someone redesign their sales team is that there is this philosophy and concept around Beatrix. Um, that's my puppy. If you can still hear this, if totally it's safe, we'll probably leave it in. She's a human uh, guys. Come on. Uh, she is amazing. She is Beatrix kiddo as in kill bill. And she will, <laughs> she'll cut you. <laughs> <She's very laughs> that's sweet. Awesome. Uh, we have two pups. We also have a Bernie's mountain dog, Oliver, who's 135 pounds and you can't see her, but Beatrix is a little tiny 
King Charles Cavalier and she's like 12 pounds and she <laughs> will smack him in the face. <laughs> yeah, she, he's like, she's like a mouthful to him. Yeah. It's like chihuahuas. <laughs> anyway, so, so back to the yes. sales though. So back to the sales thing. So what I see so often is that people spend so much money on lead generation and they are doing churn and burn sales. And what I mean by that is the person comes in, they need to immediately buy. If they don't, they are discarded. Right. And what I teach differently is that when you have somebody who comes to you, this is a lead to nurture. Sometimes the first conversation is the close. And that's what I teach. I teach the five steps to yes, so that you can connect with somebody. You can find out what their struggle is. You can identify their vision. You can give them an invitation and they will say yes. And if they are new to you, not ready to buy, it doesn't match. Well, what do you do with them? Most people discard people. They just put them into their list. What I like to do is actually stay in a state space of nurture. It's two steps. It's normally either if you identify it, there's someone you're talking to that is a close to being a buyer. I keep them in my feed. I keep talking with them. I nurture them. If I think they're going to be long-term, I continue to nurture them. This is where people always ask the question is how much follow-up is too follow-up? Too much follow-up? It's not that. It's about being in a place of filling your pipeline with humans. And here's what I mean by that. I spoke to a woman actually today, depending on when you listen to this, who knows when that was, but it's a pretty common experience. I got her on a call. We have total alignment. She's super smart. I know her business. I know how we can like scale her. She's, she's a service-based business owner and she's stuck at where, where most people get stuck. You can only do so much one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't matter what you charge. You just can't hit past a revenue goal. And so I gave her a couple of fun ideas so that she can scale. And then she says to me, Laura, I'm already in a mastermind and I just resigned for six more months. I can't work with you right now. And most people would say, failed sale, push her off, go to the next person. What I said was, fantastic. Would you like to talk in about five months? And by the way, you need to come into our Facebook group. I have this other special training. It's a free thing. Go try it out. I am going to nurture Connect. She is a long line lead for me. I have another woman who I met in 2018. And if you're listening to this right now, it's June of 2022. And I've known her since that time. And about once a year, I would do a little touch base, a genuine one to find out what's going on with her. December of 2021 is when she stepped into our program. Now, I will also tell you this. I know she will be a client for life. Like right. I know that she will not only thrive in our community, she will buy again and again and again. But what's more important is I'm going to watch her grow and thrive. And that's what I care about. So when you start to really stop thinking about the numbers and you really start thinking about the humans, what does somebody need to know to say yes to you now? And if they're not now, there's a difference between resistance. There's a difference between overcoming an objection and the fear of buying. If somebody is actually aligned and they're not to say yes, why would you discard them? I say nurture them. Yeah. And oh man, I, lo I love this methodology because, it, you know, we, we work a lot with podcasters and they're trying to sell a coaching program, right? And they're saying, Hey, I've got this big coaching program and to them. It's big because it's $5,000, right? And they're so excited about selling their $5,000 coaching program. And the problem they run into a lot of times is that they they're doing exactly what you said, right? They ask somebody like, oh, I'm already part of mastermind. Ah, oh, dang it. Boom. And then they never talk to them again. Mm -hmm. and, and what we always talk about is because I love your touch point. Hey, just touch bases in five months. What's, mm -hmm. what's it going to hurt you to put them on a list in a CRM and just say, remind me in five months to mm -hmm. talk to this person. Right. But what we found is that if they're not qualified for your offer, most of the times they have other problems that they need solved anyways. And if you just make it part of your priority to connect them with people who can help them solve those other problems, they eventually buy from you. It's the craziest thing. And some people are like, Oh, well, it's a waste of my time. I'm like, well, not really, first off, because you'll eventually get a sale. But mm -hmm. on top of that, they might just start kicking you referrals. We have this happen all the time. People who aren't even sales, like they haven't even bought, they're like, hey, I'm going to buy these guys at some point. That's usually their, their intro. We're, I'm going to buy this person mm -hmm. at some point, but you know, come hire them on. <laughs> so. I'm nodding the whole time. I don't think, no one can see this. I'm like nodding the whole time. It's actually one of my favorite things to do when I connect with somebody, like a genuine connection call, and there's not a sale moment or there's not an ask. Right. I will always find out there's a, a thing that I say at the end of all of my connection calls, because there's a difference between connection calls and sales calls. 
But right. P.S. I'll tell you a little secret. I run all my calls like a sales call, and I'll talk about that too. But um, <laughs> it, and it's because it feels good. Yeah. No one feels like I just sales should not ever feel slimy. I don't do it in a way that anyone's going to feel uncomfortable. But when I'm talking with somebody, my thing that I always end with is, "What's your big ask?" If I could just hand something to you that you needed right this minute, what would it be? A connection to a person, a type of person, a introduction an actual tool. In fact, that's how I gave the woman that I spoke to earlier today, a little, here's how to go scale your business is because when I asked her, she said, I'm stuck. (laughs) I need to scale my business. And I said, great, here's how to do it. When you can give someone a tool, you are correct. You get a, a, like a legacy connection. There's one more thing I want to say about like referrals and connecting people. I used to do this when I hosted live events for years. I'd take a moment and I'd have people stand up in the room and show that this is actually how referrals work. I might refer to you, Josh, but then Josh, you're going to go send a referral to Tina. Tina is going to send a referral to Jane and Jane will send a referral to me. Now, what we think is, we think what has to happen with referrals is if I send people to you, Josh, well, then you sure better send them back to me. And that's actually not how it goes. I do truly believe that the way that energy works is when you are out there, you've heard the term giver's gain, but when you're out there putting stuff into the world, it's going to return to you the way you need. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I wish I could like spend hours asking you questions about that because I think that's such I can a, come back. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be coming back. Don't you worry. Um, I, uh, <laughs> as if I can force you to come back on the show, <laughs> hey, I'd love to have you come back on. Um, you know, what's, what's interesting to me too, about trying to lead value first or making those referrals mm-hmm. is that many times we get hung up on, um, like trying to figure out who to refer to people. And, and you know, it's funny to me, that's never been an issue for me because I can see a clear connection, mm-hmm. but as we've coached so many people in this, they, they tend to get concerned about, well, who do I refer and when, uh, yeah. Yeah. Give I have on, everything on I want to say about this. Okay. So, yeah. um, not everybody can do connections the way that I, I'm assuming you, but I know how I can do. And so what I always suggest is that they go find a Laura, find the connector as opposed to trying to find clients for people, because again, it's a natural innate. A lot of us who are high quick starts, like on Colby, um, I'm a manifester in human design. Those of us who initiate those of us who are considered extroverted tend to know how to naturally engage and connect and also can do it in the moment. This is why also what I teach about sales is we don't do things the same way. I sell a different way than you sell than everybody else sells. You need a framework to follow so you'll know if it works, but like I'm a happy clappy person. I am usually like literally clapping and sometimes shimmying on calls and that's my energy. But I would not ask somebody who is like soulful or soft or quiet to try to pretend to be like me. I want you to be the most you and connections are one of those things that some of us can see it. Sometimes what it is about is it doesn't have to be immediate. I think that's another thing that shows up is I walked one of my past clients through this thing where um, the way we changed her sales process, and it was actually for her referrals too, was on the spot she would like stop the way that her makeup was. She was all about finding information and she literally needed to leave the call, digest it, organize it. And when she came back, the most brilliant things were said, the most brilliant options were presented, but in the moment, it wasn't something she could respond to. It's just part of her human design and the way she's made now. So we created a system for her sales process where she could do interview style gathering of information and no one had an expectation that she would present anything. Then she got to leave the call, put her brilliant mind to work, her head, heart, and soul into this invitation, then get on a secondary call and she would knock the socks off everybody. We did the same thing with connections where when somebody was in the moment asking her for something, it was like her mind would go blank. But if she left the call, even like a month later, she was the type of person that would have the mental Rolodex to know, I'm talking with Sarah, she has to know Tim and boom. So I think believing you have to do an immediate thing, I think this goes back to what we were talking about with like the churn and burn of sales. I met a woman um, today, whatever time you're listening to this, we got in a conversation and 
there's no sale to be had right now, but she's an awesome connection and I don't know what it's going to turn into. So I said, let's keep in touch. But that's what a lot of people do. They get on connections. So they're like, let's keep in touch and it floats away. My version of keep in touch is I found out something she's promoting coming up in a couple months. And I said, let's touch base when you're doing that. It just gives us a reason and a hook. And that's what creates stickiness around creating a pipeline, creating connections and allowing you to have lasting long-term sales, not just immediate sales moments. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Well, and, and, you know, it's funny, the, uh, the outreach and the way that you do it, I, I think is, is brilliant because I've been trying to get people to understand this of, oh, here's how you connect with people. People are like, oh, you just have that mental Rolodex is what you said. I love that, Mm -hmm. that term. I would say that's a, a talent and skill of mine, but with our sales team, what we found that works well. So we have six guys and me, and we do a call every single morning, a little powwow to kind of kick the day off. And we all sit down and at the beginning, they were all asking me, like, Josh, who would you connect this person with this? And it was, you know, 30, 40 people. And I just kick off names and then they would make the connection. And, mm-hmm. um, but now it's been funny as, as we've been doing that more and more, two of the six have risen up as kind of like me, where they have that mental Rolodex. And so they're kicking people leads all day, every day. While the mm-hmm. four people come into these calls, they leave with a list, they make the connection and it works just as well because like they, like you said, they found a Laura who knows, who has that mental Rolodex. That's cool. I really like that. Yeah, that's another thing that's really important is to understand. Um, so my business partner and I have something that's a archetype test for understanding how you are, how you sell. And I think what's really important about that is that not everybody sells or can initiate doing outreach the same way. And I think where everyone gets stuck is this concept of sales. I think there's two big flaws to it. One, almost no one is actually taught sales when they go into entrepreneurship or business. And so they look around for a model of somebody who's done it and they just do what everybody else did, which doesn't actually work. And it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning where they just try to do what someone else is doing. What I understand is this, you need to know how you initiate. Are you somebody that feels comfortable reaching out? If you don't feel comfortable doing it, don't do it. It won't work. However, if you need to have a process by which to do outreach, because that is my, if I was going to, if I had to start over from scratch, uh, just like. I'd say, give me a phone. I don't think these things are phones anymore, but give me a way to connect to some humans and I'm going to make a few phone calls and I can make some money. But if that doesn't feel comfortable for you and you try to do it, it's actually going to block everything. So there's other ways to initiate outreach. There's ways to get the invitation to like find the Laura who's going to feed you invitations. There's ways to put out posts or send messages that get people to respond to you. But if you can balance outbound marketing and pulling people towards you with that nurture, touch and outreach, you are going to have the best sales ever because you need the both and. If you do one directional only, you will have a very short pipeline. Oh, and that makes me think, I just want to talk about this so much. Um, Please do, share it. You need to know your buyer's sales cycle. This is critical. So I've, I've said a couple of different stories of different people buying at different times. But one of the things that we've learned is on average, our buyers buy from us within three to six months. And the way that that happens and why we know that is we watch when they come into our community or when they're introduced to us, they usually come to about three months worth of either monthly marketing moments or they will post on things. And at about the three to six month mark, they will buy. It doesn't mean that somebody doesn't come into our world and buy same day. So like, remember one of my beloved clients I've had for years, very first conversation I'd ever met her, she would be considered, I guess, a cold lead. I, we always joke around, we can't figure out where we met each other, but somehow she got on my calendar, a $45,000 sale within like 30 minutes of our call. She was saying yes. Wow. Now that happens, but I don't rely on that. I don't rely on every single person I talk to will buy immediately. I know three to six months is average. And yes, there are the outliers. We've had people who've been around us for two, three, four, five years before they buy. But PS, I'm going to be around for more than two or three or five years so they can come to buy with us. But when I know that, I can balance nurture with marketing and always have a full program. Yeah. Well, and I am 
curious with that though, because you know, we talked about this in the beginning is I believe you should pivot every two to three years mm. and, and my curiosity, and I'm not, I'm not saying you have to like close one business and start another. It means mm -hmm. making strategic adjustments. And uh, I'm curious how you can still be around for people when you make those pivots, because if their sales cycle is in fact five years and mm -hmm. you pivot halfway mm -hmm. through, how are you not losing them along the way? I love that question because the word pivot needs some definitions. Kind of like when you say blue, blue can be sky blue or midnight blue. Is it blue? So a pivot can be a one or two degree shift or a pivot can be, I was going to say a 360, but I think I mean a, a 180. 180. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> 360 um, happens I, a lot for entrepreneurship though. <laughs> th that's true. That's true. And I will say, so throughout my business, I have always had a flavor of a high level mastermind. I have, I usually transform it about every maybe two years, like a two cycle. I've had it as a six month. I've had it as a nine month. I've had it as a 12 month. I've had retreats inside of it, private inside of it. None of that. Like, so what I want you to hear is I've changed my programs and how people can work with me, but the, who I am and what I serve that stayed the same. And then I know what you're saying about the pivot and the change, because about it was 2019. I started to feel like I was in a rinse and repeat with my company. Like Epic at Sales was the name of my company. I was transitioning just to go entirely by my name, Laura Wright, worldwide. And I felt just a little stagnation. I had, you know, I knew how to sell. I'd gotten people in. I was excited by my clients, but I wasn't feeling all the way lit up. And then a fortunate thing happened with COVID. And some things had to change. And in that change, I also started to partner with my now formal business partner where we have Sold Inc. We started to play together in my business and had that pivot. And then we created a new company. I will also say with transparency, our new company is what we both did individually really, really well brought together. It's not like the pivot isn't, I'm selling sandwiches and now I'm a web designer. Our pivot was, we now do things in partnership instead of just sending referrals. The pivot was instead of doing all in person, we went to online. So I think if you can define what you mean by pivot, you can keep things fresh and exciting. What I'm a big fan of is Ascension model selling, allowing people to see, like I always talk about the fact that I have a $100,000 offer. I love this way of working. I come in and I help transform sales teams. It's a really deeply connected program that I do. It's usually over 12 months. I usually only do it with one, two, at max three clients in a year. And I talk about it because I'm helping women build up to that. We also have our $30,000 mastermind, which is filled with amazing women who are building those multi six figure businesses, getting ready for the seven figure. And we also have our inner circle and our inner circle is, you know, a way to move beyond solopreneur into like having a scalable business. But if I only had one of those ways, then people can come in and go out. What we want is for people to come in, get what they need and ascend. And sometimes people show up and I hate the hierarchy, but they show up at the highest level and that's what they need. And they come in and then they can go. But if you can have an Ascension model, it really allows you to have longevity within your business. So your pivot is a little bit different than most people's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. See, that's fantastic. And I, I am also a huge fan of the Ascension model because you're solving different pro problems mm -hmm. along the way. And, and I also well, just want to throw this out there just as a, a nugget in people's ears that the Ascension model doesn't always need to be just your products. It can be services and products of other people. I'm a huge advocate of that. <laughs> I love it. And, and I, I want, I want to say that. Yes, because I cannot tell you how many times the reason why my business partner and I are together is because the way that we have been functioning for about almost eight years is, you know, when um, you say something to someone you love and they don't hear you, but then they learn it from somebody else. And then all of a sudden they're like, Oh my God, I just heard this new thing. So we did things very similar. So we would pass clients back and forth. And when we were doing that so frequently, it was really fun to watch people like come back around. I also really want to say this about Ascension. If you have your Ascension model set up, so it's only that they have to matriculate, 
that is very rigid as well. I don't believe in the low ticket sale to the higher ticket sale to the higher to the higher. Allow people to actually arrive where they need to buy. Right. Love that. That's a beautiful, beautiful end there. I should have just ended it. Dang it. That was a good mic drop. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're going to talk forever. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just turn it off. Um, I do want to just let everybody know though, that, that Laura has an amazing gift for you all. And I'm not even going to tell you exactly what it is. I'm just going to tease it and say, if you want to improve your selling and you want to make sure that you're doing it in a way that makes you comfortable, go over to it's the sold sisters.com forward slash gift and sold is S O U L D like it's got soul. So make sure you guys check that out. And then Laura, I just want to ask you one final question. Cause we've gone way over, but it was highly, highly valuable. So I appreciate it. Um, if you could give one sales tactic to somebody who's sitting at let's just say half a million dollars and they're saying, Oh my goodness, I've stagnated like that client you mentioned earlier, they've completely mm -hmm. stagnated in sales. How would you help them? And what would be the one piece of advice you would give them to be able to, um, to be able to scale it up? Okay. If you're at a half a million and you don't already have leverage with the sales team, that's the number one thing is to leverage a sales team. The second thing that I would say within that is don't take yourself out of the proper seat in your business. Now, here's what I mean by that. I have helped um, many women scale and almost remove themselves from the business. And I remember having a client who she's like, I feel disconnected from what we're doing. Like I'm making lots of money. I love like what we're doing. And what we saw was she's so magnificent at sales. So does she do all the sales? Absolutely not. Does she take an occasional call? Yes. And what that does is that helps her hear and see what's going on. I want to give a third one because I'm too much of an overgiver in this best, best way. Please, 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 for the love of all things, holy and good. Marketing and sales are not separate. Please, please, please. Marketing department, tell your sales what they're experiencing. Sales department, give feedback to your marketing department and give it not with like, these leads are not good. Explain, hey, I just talked to three people in a row and they both had a spouse objection. We need to insert something in our marketing to start to overcome that before they come to me. Or I just talked with seven people who said that they can barely pay their basic bills. We need to tweak something on our audience. When the marketing is do like talk in tandem, that's the biggest thing that I see is I, saw, I see that right around 350 to 500, you start to create departments and they separate and one hand is doing all, I brought you 1200 leads. Why didn't you close them? I talked with 25 people that weren't effective. Why did you give us bad leads? Have the conversation to understand what's actually happening from both sides of your business.